What is faith to me? Um, faith. Faith, I think, is a combination of confidence and peace. Yeah. Faith. Um. Sorry. <laughs> These are really good questions. Trust. Um, I'm confirmed if that helps. I am CNE Anglican, which means I go to church for my grand on Christmas and Easter. Believing without seeing. He also has faith in me that their next step after this interview will it's be food. food yeah. I don't think faith has to do with religion. I don't know. I don't know how to describe faith. It is believing in something that even that you haven't seen it yourself. Something that gets you through the day. Good morning, Factory. Also, good morning to the warehouse and fire hall. My name is Matthias. I attend Saturday night here at the Factory, and I'll be reading our scripture for today. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Through their faith, the people in days of old earned a good reputation. By faith, we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God. But faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces, a good, unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless." So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. May God bless the reading of his word. Well, thank you, Matthias. And I want to say good morning also to our friends in Churchill, to those who are watching online, uh, to the factory, to the warehouse. Uh, great to be with you this morning and here at the, uh, at the factory, at the fire hall as well. We've got so many sites, I get them all mixed up. Uh, so... Some weekends, uh, I kind of feel like church needs a sermon. Um, that would probably be most weekends. And then there's occasions where I feel like uh, church just needs a good story. And so I want you to sit back and enjoy a story today. The door swings open, the judge fills the doorway, and the bailiff barks, All rise! You've never been called to jury duty before, and you're so busy drinking in the marble columns and ornate woodwork you almost miss your cue, but you stand, and the judge enters. Now, most trials are criminal trials, but this one is much more of a civil trial. The judge begins the trial with instructions and explains to you, the jurors, that your role is to be triers of the facts. When he's done, the trial begins with opening statements. The prosecutor rises to her feet. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you, st you sit up a little bit taller in your seat as if she's speaking directly to you. Pointing to the prisoner's box, she says, Today the people charge faith with the crime of impersonating a valid ideology and fabricating the truth in an elaborate scam. Objection, yells the young, overly eager defense lawyer. Already annoyed, the judge warns, You can't object, counselor. These are just opening statements. Sit down and wait your turn. The prosecution lawyer rambles on for a few minutes with an impassioned speech about how faith is irrelevant. She routinely overpromises and underdelivers. She deals in speculation. She habitually ignores science and logic and reason. And at its worst, she is terrifying and vile. With a smile that she says she has a lot more where that came from, the prosecutor closes her opening statements and gives the floor to the rookie defense lawyer before he's even opened his mouth. The thought strikes you, wow, Faith must be in bigger trouble than I first thought if this is the best lawyer she can hire. With sweat growing under his arms, he attempts to sound big and convincing, but his opening statements come off sounding more like a bad sermon he ripped off the internet. Faith is the cornerstone of Christianity, he says. During this trial, I'll share some of my own faith story and evidence that when God closes a door, it's faith that opens a window. Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I will show that we are saved by faith alone, but not by a faith that is alone. The fact is, God will never give up on us and never give us more than we can handle, but that requires faith to see it. You look over at the prosecutor. She's smelling blood in the water and can't wait to call her first witness. 
The jury is beginning to sink in their seats out of embarrassment, and even the judge looks bored. Finally, the defense lawyer sits down and instinctively pulls at his shirt to air it out a little bit. Without skipping a beat, the prosecutor calls her first witness. It's the famed German philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Dr. Nietzsche, in your professional opinion, what does it mean when a person claims to have faith? The doctor massages his chin for a moment and, and replies, faith means not wanting to know what is true. Ouch. That's a decisive point for the prosecution. Her next witness is Samuel Longhorn Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, the American writer and humorist. Mr. Clemens, for the record, what do you believe is the mental stability of people who, quote, have faith and live by faith? It's Mark Twain, he says, with a southern accent and a chuckle, and, and says, I'd say, faith is believing what you know ain't so. So people of faith are either liars or very deceived. Your word's not mine, Miss Prosecutor, but I wouldn't disagree with you. Next, she calls world-renowned scientist, politician, and inventor, Benjamin Franklin. Mr. Benjamin Franklin, is, is faith a reasonable and honest way to live? Mr. Franklin, as, as if acting out his statement, closes his eyes and says, Young lady, the only way to see by faith is to shut the eye of reason. For more than two hours... Witness after witness chips away at Faith's credibility, but the cross prosecutor is saving the best for last. She calls Kurt Vonnegut, the American playwright and author of 14 novels, to the stand. Mr. Vonnegut, you call yourself a Christ-loving atheist, and you have many friends who are Christians. So what is your conclusion about faith? Say what you will about the sweet miracle of unquestioning faith. I consider a capacity for it terrifying and absolutely vile. Sitting with your peers in the jury, you figure this trial is about over and it has barely begun. These witnesses have made it pretty clear faith might have been relevant in the dark ages, but not after the Enlightenment. They hadn't just made faith look out of touch and irrational, but it made her look deviant and sinister and maleficent. You wonder what the defense lawyer could even say, would even dare to say after such damning evidence, but to your surprise, he stands and announces, Your Honor, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, our case is not the least bit intimidated by the prosecution's charges, and we're prepared to show that everybody lives by faith, and that faith is not just fairy dust that floats around, but, but the very currency by which heaven operates. I would like to call my first witness, Dr. Luke. The judge looks annoyed again. Dr. Luke who, counselor? No last name, Your Honor, the young lawyer states confidently. You can call him St. Luke, the Apostle Luke, or Dr. Luke. He's the author of the third gospel, the New Testament. Yes, yes, I know his credentials, the judge mutters with a slight bit of embarrassment. Carry on. Dr. Luke, I, I find it compelling that you, a medical doctor and a historian, write a lot about faith in your gospels. How many times do you actually use the word faith? Caught a little bit off guard, Luke confesses, well, I've never actually counted. 21. 21 times. You see, I did count. 21 times you record the word faith, and every time you are quoting the words of Jesus. An earlier witness, Dr. Frederick Nietzsche, stated, faith means not wanting to know what is true. Would that have been Jesus' impression of faith? Absolutely not, Luke says. Then it was more like Benjamin Franklin said, the only way to see by faith is to shut your eye to reason. No, that wasn't Jesus' take on faith either. After tr tracking all his teaching and encounters with people, I'd have to conclude that Jesus believed faith was weighty and substantial. Surely you don't mean substantial. Substantial infers size and physical matter and bulkiness. That's not what you mean, is it? That's exactly what I mean. Jesus asked his disciples, where is your faith? Like it was an object that, that might have been misplaced. He told a woman, your faith has made you well in a way that she wouldn't have been made well if she didn't have faith. His followers asked him, how do we increase our faith? And he didn't scold them for the question, but told them that very little faith is required to affect huge change. But what sticks with me the most, said Dr. Luke, is when he said to a crippled man, stand up and go, your faith has healed you. That kind of faith isn't about closing your eyes to reason as much as opening your eyes and seeing something beyond reason. Now you want to hear a lot more of what Dr. Luke has to say, but but the young lawyer lets him go and calls out, Your Honor, I'd like to call my next witness. 
and then he butchers his name. I'd like to call Dr. Anthony Van Leeuwenhoek. Can I just call you Dr. Anthony? Dr. Anthony, what happened to you on September the 17th, 1683? Well, that's the day I first saw them. Saw who? Saw what, Dr. Anthony? Animalcules. Animalcules? What do you mean? Oh, you mean molecules. No, no, animalcules. Tiny swimming creatures. You see, I had scraped some of that hard stuff off from between my teeth. You mean plaque? Yeah, yes, that's what it is, plaque. I scraped some plaque and I put it under my ground lens contraption, and to my utter shock, I saw them, hundreds, no, thousands of terrifying and beautiful animalcules. In fact, didn't you write this letter to the British Society, Royal Society? I then most always saw with great wonder that in the said matter, there were many very little living animalcules, very prettily moving, but the biggest sort had very strong and swift motion and shot through the water. The unbelievably great company of living animalcules were of such enormous number that all the water seemed to be alive. And what was the scientific community, their response to your claim? They didn't believe me. Hang on. You were the first person to break past the limits of, ma of the macroscopic world, the world we can see and touch, and the first human to cross the threshold into the microscopic world, and no one believed you? Why? They said it wasn't rational. It wasn't reasonable. They said I was imagining things. It, it violated the most obvious common sense. They called me a magician, actually even worse, a conjurer. I know what I saw, but they refused to believe me that there were swimming creatures in the male seed. Oh, oh yes, I almost forgot you discovered sperm. The judge shoots a young lawyer a look. Counsel, what is your point? Sir, simply to prove that logic and reason and common sense are often limited and sometimes even wrong. There are those who can see beyond conventional views, and they are fueled by faith and conviction, even when the evidence is not completely understood. Sitting there, you have to admit, this guy is finding his rhythm. I'd like to call my next witness, Your Honor. The defense calls the Apostle Paul. When Paul is settled into his seat and sworn in with his hand on a Bible that he helped write, the lawyer begins, Apostle, did you write the book of Hebrews in the New Testament? Objection, Your Honor, yells the prosecution. We're not here to argue the authorship of ancient texts. Sustained. Apostle, you are familiar with the text referred to as Hebrews chapter 11. I am. And how is faith described in that chapter? Well, Hebrews 11, 1 says... Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Okay, what in the world does that mean, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen? Young man, do you have a $5 bill you can give me? Now, from the look on his face, you and the judge both think that this is a little bit of an odd time for the apostle to be taking up an offering. The young lawyer digs into his pocket but comes up empty-handed. However, the judge, intrigued by where this might be going, drops... Uh, digs in and finds a $5 bill and offers it to the Apostle Paul. Paul takes the bill and holds it up and says, In 1872, the Reverend Robert McGuire explained it this way, Faith is like a banknote issued for the currency and circulating in the market. The banknote circulates as money, and yet it is not money. It is only a piece of tissue paper. It's a promissory note, a promise, and it is received on the faith that in re reposed in the name of the promiser. It is actually the substance of that which is promised. The young lawyer genuinely asks, are you saying every time we use money, we're actually using faith? Paul rep replies, that wasn't my point, but, but yes, that is true. Money in itself is nothing apart from the faith we put in it. One bill might have a five on it. The next might have an additional zero to make it 50, the next another zero to make it 500, but the paper itself is worth the same, nearly nothing, and money on its own is meaningless, apart from faith. Money is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of actual value and worth uh, out of sight. Shooting a glare to the prosecution table, Paul continues, so don't go giving me this nonsense about faith being unreasonable and only for the gullible. Everybody uses faith every day. 
But my actual point was that faith is the currency of heaven. When Jesus saw that someone was acting on faith, he he responded, and the doors of heaven were swung wide open, and the power of God poured out. But when he walked into a town where there was little or no faith, heaven's doors were shut, and the flow of God's power stopped. The doors of heaven swing on the hinges of faith. God's power is made real by faith. Apostle Paul, I want to make sure the court, the prosecution, and the jury are absolutely clear on how we're using the term faith. Isn't it true that faith refers to the beginning of a relationship with God? Isn't faith most often thought of as needed when someone becomes a Christian? Absolutely. Forgive me for quoting my own writing, but but I'm on the record for stating, God sent Christ to be our sacrifice. Christ offered His life's blood so that by faith in Him, we could come to God. I wrote in Ephesians 2, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself, it is a gift of God. Faith is undoubtedly the first rung on the ladder to a relationship with God. My buddy John, in Revelation 3.20, quoting Jesus, says this, Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will share a meal together as friends. As if just remembering something, the young lawyer interrupts the apostle and says, Your Honor, Your Honor, I'd like to submit Exhibit A. It's DVD evidence to corroborate what the apostle has just stated. I'd ask that we take a moment in the courtroom to view the evidence. In Romans 10, 17, Paul says, Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of God. You may have experienced this already gradually on Alpha as you've listened to the talks and discussed in your groups. That was my experience. As I read the Bible, I became convinced it was true. Faith for me came through hearing and hearing through reading the Bible. The Bible is a way that we interact with God. We'll look at that in more detail later in the series. But you can read the Word of God and begin to put it in practice. For example, one promise that Jesus gives is in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus says this, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Holman Hunt, the pre-Raphaelite artist, illustrated this verse with a painting. It's called The Light of the World and it hangs right here in St. Paul's Cathedral. Jesus, the light of the world, stands at a door which is overgrown with ivy and weeds. The door represents the door of someone's life. This person has never invited Jesus to come into his or her life. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. He's awaiting a response. He wants to come in and be part of that person's life and eat with them. Eating together is a sign of friendship and Jesus offers that friendship to everyone who opens the door of their lives to him. Apparently someone said to Holman Hunt that he'd made a mistake. They said to him, look, you've forgotten to paint a handle on the door. No, he replied, that's deliberate. There is a handle, but it's on the inside. In other words, we have to open the door to let Jesus into our lives. Jesus is not going to force his way into your life. He gives you the freedom to choose whether to invite him into your life. But his promise is this. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Not I might come in or I'll think about it. You can be sure that if you invite him, he will come in. Pressing for crystal clarity, the young lawyer says, So, Mr. Paul, you are saying that faith is really most necessary and useful during the season of a person's life when they are beginning their relationship with God, swinging the door of their heart open to Jesus. Sadly, that's what most people believe, but it couldn't be further from the truth, Paul says. Jesus' own brother, James, wrote, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith, and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. That would seem to indicate that there are those in the world who are 
poor in the currency of faith and those who are rich in the currency of faith. That's not just a salvation thing. That's an everyday thing. Faith is very useful and absolutely necessary to get your relationship with God going, but it is the modus operandi for Christ followers. Every day is to be an adventure of faith, and Christ followers are to deal heavily in the currency of faith. In fact, I wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, but we live by faith, not by what we see. Paul continued, it's not that we are anti-reason or anti-science or anti-sensible or anti-seeing. It's just that we aren't bound by reason, science, and common sense. We look beyond them to see and access more. We are to live, move, breathe every day by faith. As if suddenly sparked by an idea and remembering he has more witnesses, the young lawyer thanks the Apostle Paul and calls his next witness. I'd like to call to the stand Mother Angelica. Let the record show her birth certificate actually reads Rita Antoinette Rizzo. Now, Mother Angelica, you are a Roman Catholic nun, is that correct? Mother Angelica nods slightly. And you are on the record as saying, quote, unless you have faith and are willing to do the ridiculous, God will not do the miraculous. When you have God, you don't have to know everything about it, you just do it. What evidence do you have that would suggest that that is actually true? And isn't that statement like this that actually fuels the, the prosecution's case, suggesting that faith is irresponsible and reckless and rash? Shooting him a look that only a mother could, she fires back, have you read your Bible lately, son? God asked Moses to talk to a burning bush. That's ridiculous. There were snakes turned to, to sticks and then back again. Ridiculous. Rivers stopped on command, clouds burst, winds became motionless when told. Nahum was told to dip in the river seven times, and in faith he did, and was healed of leprosy. That's ridiculous. When Elijah's axe head flew off of his handle and into the water, he got a, a stick, he threw it in, in faith, and threw it into that same spot, and the axe head floated to the surface. Absolutely preposterous. The young lawyer, realizing he may be strengthening the opposition's case with this crackpot, tries to interrupt Mother Angelica, but she's on a roll, and she rolls right over him. Hosea was told to do the ridiculous, to marry a prostitute. Jesus said to a blind man, hey, let me spit in the dirt and make some mud and smear it in your eyes, and then you go wash in the pool of Shalom. In faith, the man did, and he was healed. That's ridiculous. Jesus told a servant to fill pots with water, and because of that act of faith, the water turned to wine at the wedding. A ridiculous act of a, a young boy offering a bit of fish and bread fed a crowd of 5,000. Jesus was the master of the ridiculous, telling gainfully employed people to leave their careers and come follow him. In the book of Acts, midnight worship gatherings caused seismic tremors that by faith shook prisons and set captives free. Demons were kicked out of people and moved into pigs by faith and completely fueled by faith, Jesus instructed Peter to step out of a boat and come walk on the water with him ridiculous. So this is why I say, unless you have faith and are willing to do the ridiculous, God will not do the miraculous. But are you suggesting that people go out and do crazy stuff in order to see the word, the power of God at work in their lives? Emphatically, the little nun says, yes. And an audible gasp echoes in the courtroom, although no one is quite sure exactly where the winded person was that, uh, that responded to the statement. Mother Angelica seized upon the opportunity, but not just random crazy stuff. Son, back in 1981, I felt like God was asking me to do something ridiculous, start using TV and radio to get the message out. He could have asked me to walk on water or walk around the walls of Jericho seven times, and I wouldn't have been more surprised. I'm a mild-mannered nun who has spent the last 20 years in a monastery. What do I know about broadcasting on TV and radio? So I had a choice to make. Would I ignore the ridiculous call of God, or would I take some small faith steps and walk into the ridiculous? The young lawyer, feeling like Mother Angelica might not be so bad after all, decides to get on board and see where this could go. So what did you do, Mother Angelica, he asked. Thrilled to be back in the game, she shot him a smile and said, I did the ridiculous. I bought some equipment, read some instruction manuals, and started broadcasting from my garage. Slightly off track, the young lawyer said, nuns have garages? Where do you think we keep our lawnmowers and bicycles, she chided. Of course we have garages, but that's not the point. If we could get to the point, that would be most pleasing to the court, the judge said. 
The point is, today, Network EWTN is on Sirius XM Radio, has 500 affiliate stations worldwide, reaches into 250 million homes in 140 countries, and has a $52 million yearly revenue. But none of that would be possible without faith, ridiculous faith. Hoping Mother Angelica would follow his lead, the young lawyer asked, but, but not many are asked to start a radio, a religious broadcasting network. No, Mother Angelica replied. God asks each of us to take even more ridiculous steps of faith. When a person feels betrayed or hurt or wounded, the most ridiculous sounding idea in the world to that person is to forgive the person who ruined their life. But unless you have faith and are willing to do the ridiculous, God will not do the miraculous. God's miracles of healing is released when you take the first step of forgiveness. But at the time, it feels impossible and utterly ridiculous. When a person is used to living for themselves and they hear God whisper an invitation to, to lay down their lives to their own agenda and to come serve Him, at first, it doesn't just sound ridiculous, but scary and unreasonable and even dangerous. Many will cover their ears and try to ignore God's nudges. But when they walk into the ridiculous and they begin to serve, I mean, really get their hands dirty serving others. As someone said earlier, the doors of heaven swing on hinges of faith and the miraculous becomes a reality through the ridiculous. At this point, Mother Angelica begins to preach a bit, but at 92 years old and with such fire in her bones, nobody dares to stop her. Christians in North America wonder why they don't see more of the miraculous power of God in their lives. I'll tell you why, she says. They are living boring, safe, predictable lives. Hello, Jesus wasn't boring or predictable. You want to see your neighborhood restored? You want to see your family reunited? You want to see your high school transformed? You want to see your marriage rise up off of life support? You want to see people swing open the doors of their hearts to Jesus? You want to do more than drag your sorry, she catches herself, your sorry carcass through life, and you want to feel like God is alive in you with His power? Do that ridiculous thing that seems completely illogical and, irre and irresponsible and impossible and get ready for a miracle. Pick up the phone and admit you blew it and ask forgiveness. Trade your vacation on the beach for a mission trip. Show up and feel the burn of serving others with the best of who you are. Write that check that seems ridiculous. Do that ridiculous thing and you'll see miracles. The young lawyer forgets himself and claps, but only once before the judge stops him with a sideways look and a question, are you about done, the judge asks. Oh, yes, Your Honor. I mean, no, no, Your Honor. I, I have one more witness. So the lawyer stands to his feet and says, the defense would like to call Philip Bliss. Mr. Bliss enters the courtroom humming an old hymn you think you recognize after he's sworn in and the questions begin. Mr. Bliss, we're here to decide if faith is a sham or is a legitimate way to live. Can you tell the court when you first remember placing your faith in Jesus Christ? Well, that would be 1850, sir. I was 12 years old and remember being baptized in a declaration of my faith in Jesus. You see, I'd left home a year earlier when I was 11 to work in a timber camp, but, but returned home as often as I could to continue my schooling, and that's when I was baptized. Now, Mr. Bliss, truth be told, your life didn't turn out all that great, did it? I mean, you followed God even into the ridiculous, but you and your loving wife, Lucy, were killed at the age of 38. Are you really living proof that a life of faith is beneficial and profitable? Realizing that the entire courtroom is now hanging on what he's about to say, Mr. Bliss ponders the question and then says, yes, no, and yes. The prosecutor jumps to her feet. Your Honor, the defense is muddying the waters here. Is it yes or no? It can't be both. Counselor, ask better questions and let's get some clarity, barks the judge. Mr. Bliss, I'm guessing you can explain your answer. Yes, sir, Bliss says, collecting his thoughts. Are we living proof that a life of faith is beneficial and profitable? Absolutely. When I was 36 years old, the famous Bible teacher and evangelist D.L. Moody asked if I would join his team as a worship leader and musician. Oh, yes, you, you've written some 150 songs, haven't you? Correcting him, Bliss says without an air of pride. Actually, it was more like 160 songs. Leaving my profession, 
And going to win souls with Dr. Moody seemed like one of those ridiculous, doesn't make sense callings of God. But as we stepped out in faith, Lucy and I were having the time of our lives. But couldn't it be said that faith sucked you in, tricked you, and then turned on you? After all, your life didn't turn out very well. It's true that it didn't turn out the way we had dreamt. Can you tell the court what happened to you on the night of December 29th, 1876? Lucy and I had left our two sons, age four and one, at their aunt's place, and we boarded a train in Ohio for the next crusade. It was a cold night, I remember, so all the kerosene lanterns and heaters were doing their best to keep the train coaches warm. We weren't very far into our journey when we heard this deafening crack and felt like we were falling. The train trestle we were crossing over in Ohio had collapsed, and 11 cars were tumbling into a 70-foot deep ravine. Before we even hit the bottom, most of the cars were on fire due to the kerosene heaters. I'm not sure how long I was out, but when I woke up, I managed to climb out a window. I started screaming for Lucy, but I couldn't find her. Assuming she was stuck in the burning car, I ran back in, and that's the last anyone saw of us. Pardon the pun, Mr. Bliss, but but you got burnt by faith. Your faith sucker punched you and ended up stealing your life, leaving you at the bottom of a ravine in Ohio. That's what a lot of people were thinking at the time, explained Mr. Bliss, while reaching for the Bayless Bible that was sitting on the ledge. But that's only because they misunderstand faith. Looking over at the prisoner's box, he says, faith faith never promised an easy life. Faith might be the currency of heaven. But it's not a a straight exchange. You don't just gather up a certain quantity of faith and hand it over, getting an easy, successful life in return. I would offer Hebrews 11 as evidence. Objection, Your Honor. We've already been through this with the witness, uh, uh, the Apostle Paul. Turning to the witness, the judge asked, Mr. Bliss, will you be rereading the verses at the beginning of Hebrews 11? No, Your Honor. You see, the whole chapter is about faith. In fact, her name is used 31 times in the chapter, but there's something quite revealing towards the end. Overruled, muttered the judge. Please carry on. Thank you, sir. Hebrews 11.33. By faith, these people overthrew kingdoms, ruled with justice, and received what God had promised them. They shut the mouths of lions, quenched the flames of fire, and escaped death by the edge of the sword. Their weakness was turned to strength. They became... They became strong in battle and put whole armies to flight. Women received their loved ones back again from the dead. But others were tortured, refusing to turn from God in order to be set free. They placed their hope in a better life after the resurrection. Some were jeered at, and their backs were opened with whips. Others were chained in prisons. Some died by stoning. Some were sawn in half, and others were killed with a sword. Some went about wearing skins of sheep and goats, destitute and oppressed and mistreated. They were too good for this world, wandering over deserts and mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these people earned a good reputation because of their faith, yet none of them received all that God had promised. For God had something better in mind for us. Mr. Bliss said, faith isn't just a way to get what you want or to smooth out the wrinkles of life. He said, look at the fascinating verse, words in verse 40. For God had something better in mind for us. This is why reason and science and rational logic in and of themselves don't get faith. Because faith touches the world beyond reason's reach. Reason and science and rational logic end at the grave. And that's when faith really shows what she's all about. Faith connects us to a hope and a promise beyond the grave. Looking at his notes to the next question, the young lawyer says, Mr. Bliss, you wrote the famous hymns, Hallelujah, What a Savior. Yes. Jesus Loves Even Me. Yes. The Wonderful Words of Life. Yes. You wrote the music to It Is Well With My Soul. And yet, all the uh, 160 songs you've written, you say the hymn that you like the best that's your favorite is called, I Will Sing of My Redeemer. Why is that? (laughs) I realize it's not the hippest song with the coolest lyrics that all the kids are singing, but it is my favorite. You see, it's my legacy. 
It's my final message to this world. You see, after the wreckage had cooled and 92 bodies had been removed, it was someone's job to go through the charred luggage and return it to the rightful owners. When they found Lucy in my trunk, they found a piece of paper with scorched edges that contained the lyrics to a song that I was just beginning to work on. It was still a bit rough, but I really liked the words to the third stanza. I will praise my dear Redeemer. His triumphant power, I'll tell, how the victory He gives me over sin and death and hell. I realize ideas like that don't make much sense to the prosecution's witnesses, Dr. Nietzsche, Mark Twain, Benjamin Franklin, or Kurt Von Gut, and yet, and yet they offer, those people offer not a shred of hope or triumph or power or victory over sin, over death, or over hell. Lucy and I, Lucy and I may have died in that horrific train crash, but by faith, I can tell you it wasn't the end, not by a long shot. With that, the defense rests, and the judge begins to tidy his desk and turns to you, the jury. Folks, says the judge in the most compassionate voice he's had all trial, you have a hard decision to make. Is faith guilty of being an imposter, a scam? hollow of substance? Or is faith truly the currency of heaven and the hinges on which the doors of heaven swing, as the defense has argued? And remember, your answer is not simply hypothetical. What you decide will set the course of your life and your eternity from this day forward. The case is now in your hands. When I think about faith and our church, I think there's probably a lot of people in our church who are rich in the currency of faith. They've learned that faith is more than just how to start a relationship with God, and they, in fact, live their lives by faith. But I also think that there might be a greater number of people that are part of Riverwood that are poor in faith because of the messages of our Western culture and these pressing ideas of reason and science and all these really great things, but they end up becoming poor in the currency of faith and they don't begin to trust God for very much. In fact, I think there's probably a lot of people at our church who are living what Mother Angelica would say are boring, predictable lives, lives that don't venture into the ridiculous at all and don't see the miraculous. You know, uh, last weekend we had an opportunity to talk about the switch that's at the foot of the cross. And I talked to a number of people afterwards, and uh, there were people who said, you know, and they, I loved it. I loved how transparent they were. They said, you know what, I don't think I've ever flipped that switch. And they went away to, way to think about what it would mean to flip that switch at the foot of the cross, to activate all that the cross means for them. I had one lady uh, walk up to me afterwards, and she stopped me outside, and she said, uh, Switch at the foot of the cross. How do you do that? I said, well, it has to be a heart thing first. And I said, I really think it's cemented in a, in a prayer. She says, well, what would I pray? And I told her. She said, well, where, where and when would I pray this? And I said, you know what? I know no better time than right now. And so we, we prayed. And she prayed to accept Christ right on the pavement, right in front of the factory here and, and flipped that switch. But that's only the beginning. And if you can think back to that moment when you flipped the switch uh, at the foot of the cross, you need to know that was only the beginning of what was intended to be in a complete life full of faith. I think many of us have probably long blocked out those ridiculous calls of God, but I want to remind you today that it's in the ridiculous that triggers the miraculous. And we have the opportunity every single day to swing the doors of heaven on the hinges of faith. Now, I thought it would be really appropriate for us at all of our worship communities to uh, take a moment to actually learn and sing that legacy song that Philip Bliss wrote that he never had the opportunity to, to share uh, because he passed away. Somebody took the song and put, uh, put music to it, put a melody to it. So I asked our worship director, uh, Ben, if he would lead us in this song, and he said no. Um, so I, I had to say, well, why not? He said, well, the fact is our worship teams are all over at all of our worship communities and the timing doesn't line up. He says, if you want to do the song, you're going to have to do it yourself. 
I said, okay, great. So I, uh, I recruited some help. So uh, Lawrence over at the warehouse and Dennis over at the fire hall, uh, we as an entire church community are going to sing, I will sing of my Redeemer's love, and we're going to celebrate what God has done for us. And I'm going to release you guys over at the warehouse and fire hall right now. Warehouse, I know you guys are having a pancake breakfast in a few minutes. Uh, save a pancake for me, will you? I'll be right over. Uh, God bless you guys and have a great rest of your week.